Coming up on Theater Talk. I think it's serendipitous that this moment has arrived and Finian's Rainbow is here when we have a black president and we have financial issues uh, abound. And, um, and it's ultimately a show about, you know, hope. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. Daniel Craig and Hugh Jackman have just opened on Broadway in a new play called A Steady Rain. Uh, but the critics have been a little cool to the play. Here to discuss it, two critic friends of ours, Jacques Lesseur of CBS Radio. Welcome to Theater Talk, Jacques. Thank you. And Mike Couchoir from the Associated Press. Thank Welcome. you. Um, all right, this was... Uh, the, uh, eagerly anticipated event, Daniel Craig and Hugh Jackman opening in a play that had something like a $12 million advance. But uh, you guys seem to be sort of disappointed in this damp squib of a play, Mike. It's, yeah, it's kind of a mousy uh, little drama. And it's, a, it's mostly monologues, which I think is one reason why the critics were so disappointed. There's really not much interaction between the two uh, gentlemen on stage. But I have to give them credit. They are on stage for the full 90 minutes, so people, I think they're getting their... $130 Except they're not taking their clothes off, which is what people they're seem not to even. Before. Are they rolling up their sleeves? I don't think yes, they, they are. Yes, they do. take they their roll. jackets off. They, they have take their jackets off. Well, Hugh Jackman is the darling of Broadway, so everybody wants to see him. But I think the nice surprise in this production is Daniel Craig, who doesn't have much New York experience, have any New York experience on the stage. And he really comes across the stronger, the more well-rounded character. And his is an interesting performance. I think there's no... There's no arguing that it's their interesting performances, but very minimally packaged. The set by Scott Pask is sort of good, as a matter of fact. But uh, if I think anybody who goes should diminish their expectations and be prepared to admire some acting. I mean, what is this play about? What are the, what's going on? It's here? about the relationship between two Chicago policemen, a good cop and a bad cop and how an incident that they both cover sort of affects their lives. Mm -hmm. There's a, Actually, there's a lot of plot, you know, put into these 90 minutes. In fact, way too much plot. It's sort of like several episodes of Law and Order all strung together and kind of mixed up into one big unappetizing stew. And a lot of it is recycled, such as the Jeffrey Dahmer story. Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Totally yes, recycled. They, did they bring in Jeffrey Dahmer? No. It's a sort of an incident that's sort of like the Jeffrey Dahmer case, which happened in Milwaukee. It's been vague, it's been transferred to Chicago, and it's an incident that's similar to the Jeffrey Dahmer case. Uh, and but everyone case, will recognize, recognize it as uh, as the Jeffrey Dahmer case. And they're both doing Chicago accents. Yes. Well, uh, Craig doing it better than uh, Mr. Jackman. When they both started, it reminded me of Saturday Night Live. You know, George went saying the Bears, but then you you got more used to it. But you're right, Jackman went in and out of the Chicago exit. Yet it was quite amazing that they could do that at all. You couldn't see two American actors pulling off such a sort of regional Cockney thing. But I have a friend who England. admires uh, who likes them both for their foreign accents, the British and <laughs> yes, the Australian. Yes. And she went, you know, all excited, and she's. They were doing these Chicago accents, and she was really disappointed. With their clothes on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the problems for Jackman is that he's such a likable performer. And he's in this the bad book, cop. Play, and he has to play the bad cop. So it's a real stretch for him when he doesn't quite succeed. They no. certainly weren't those characters. And Daniel Craig is such a gorgeous man. He plays mousy. Well, as well, he has very hard to well, see I, James Well, I wish Bond. I had thought I can't take credit for this, but several of the critics said he looked like a 1970s porn star. Yes, which he that's did right. with the, right. with yeah. the yeah. handlebar yeah. mustache. Handlebar mustache. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he looks terrific. And he's he has this kind of defeated quality in the plates. And yeah. he's terrific in it, actually. I yeah. think he is the real revelation of this production, yeah. I think. Yeah, it was sort of the Hugh Jackman show, Hugh yes. bringing Daniel Craig along, but Daniel Craig has emerged with mm -hmm. slightly better reviews, I think. But I think you should have dinner after the show because I hear, hear that people who have dinner first fall asleep because the lighting is very dim. It sees two actors, and it's, there's well, not the, much Well, the question excitement. I have, that there's been a lot of talk in the press that um, Daniel Craig and Hugh Jackman have both been annoyed that cell phones have been going off and they've stopped the course, show to yell yes. at people. I wonder if they'll stop the show to yell at people when they're yawning. They, or they sleeping, may. or <laughs> snoring. They may. Well, snoring. But for all snoring. of it, you know, and even though there were moments where I, I, I wasn't, didn't think that they were inhabiting the characters that well, still here were these two gorgeous, wonderful, 
performers on the stage before me, and I was completely captivated by it, and and, and really just felt I was lucky to see those two working together. But their together. gorgeousness is definitely subdued. I mean, there's no playing up of their gorgeousness. Well, chacun a son goût. Well, I like those Chicago but, You know, it accents. won't matter what we say. The show is sold yeah. out for its run, and yeah. they can charge whatever. They're, well, we should say the premium price prices. tickets are going for something like $350. Or more for a so certain what is, performances. So what is for an 85-minute play? That's correct. And the grosses, over a million a week. I mean, they're setting house records, but it's kind of easy to set a house record if your premium prices are like 350 bucks, and your regular price is 130 and then going up to 140 for the last week of the run. I don't know. It sounds like an underwhelming star vehicle to me. It is not a must-see for the beginning of no. the season. But there is one that you like very much that's sort of surprising to us. The Royal Family, which I was delighted by. I a revival of the old George S. Kaufman, Edna Ferber play that's basically like the, the Barrymore acting it's plan. It's the family. Barrymore family, and it's the classic, you know, backstage. But when actors backstage had a glamour about them, <laughs> and were, and it's, it's it just, it has a marvelous cast. I saw the, the not the original production in 1926, <laughs> but the 1975. It was my first year of review. Which was taped, and you can see on PBS from yes, time to time. Yes, and Eva Legallian was yeah. the star, and Rosemary Harris was in it, and now Jan Maxwell is playing the Rosemary Harris role, and Rosemary Harris is the Eva Legallian person. Directed by Doug Hughes, who directed Doubt. It is flawless. Oh, I mean, ex not exactly flawless, because there are a few duds in some of the minor roles for which are surprising. But Reg Rogers, I've never seen him do this sort of over-the-top John Barrymore thing. Mm -hmm. It's great fun. It's three acts, but it's, it's marvelous fun. It's a season opener that sort of gives us all a booster shot of love for the theater, theater people. I'm starved. I haven't had a bite for 12 hours. Bring me everything you've got. But first, I've got to have a hot bath. Come on upstairs, everybody, when I take a bath. <laughs> John Glover is in it. Jan Maxwell is over the top. But she's always, t and she's been in so many imperiled productions. I'm glad she's finally in a winning production. When the season is over, I think Steady Rain is not going to be remembered. No. It'll be remembered for the fact that these two megastars came to Broadway. But people are going to remember things like The Royal Family. They're going to remember Superior Donuts, which is Tracy Letts, uh, a new play from Chicago. A terrific cast with um, Michael McKean. Okay. Okay. The test is name ten black folks. <laughs> Ten. Yeah. That's not a racist test. That's a poet test. <laughs> I'll even throw in Langston, all right? He could be number one. Go. Ten poets. If you say Nipsey Russell, the game is over. And I think what Superior Donuts has that Steady Rain doesn't have are characters you can really care about. You're rooting for these, these two guys, uh, an aging white owner of a rundown donut shop in Chicago and this brash young you know black kid who comes in to try to help him save the business they're terrific characters and the whole Steppenwolf uh, cast is superb they you know they, they, they brought everybody from Chicago and talk about Chicago accents yeah. this <laughs> cast has got it nailed you're like a f***ing after school special do you hear yourself is that bad advice stay in school is that wrong yeah, well, what is this? you captain of the starship now captain what's his <laughs> So basically here, you can skip a steady rain, and you should see the royal family and the Tracy Let's Play yeah. Superior, Superior Donuts. Definitely. All right. Jacques Lesseur from CBS Radio, Mike Couchoir from the Associated Press, thanks for being our guests tonight. Thank and you right. guys are replacing Craig and Jackman in Steady Yes, yes. We're, we're, and, we're, and I suggested Mike and I could come and do yeah. the show. We're, 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 yes. <laughs> we're doing the bus and truck tour. <laughs> Let yeah. me hear your Chicago okay. accent, yeah, boys. Something in your eyes I see Soon begins bewitching me It's that old devil That you stole from the skies It's that old devil It's a big year for the lyricist Via Parberg. He would be 113 now if he were alive, but his career is having a comeback. Last month, we celebrated the 70th anniversary of The Wizard of Oz, for which he wrote the lyrics. And right now, they're mounting a revival of his most successful Broadway musical, 
Finian's Rainbow. And we are joined by Arthur Perlman, who has adapted the book to this new production of Finian's Rainbow, about mm -hmm. to open at the St. James. That's Welcome right. to uh, Theater Talk, Arthur. Thank and you. we're very pleased to have back on the show the lyricist Michael Corey, who was here a few months ago talking about the lyrics of Oscar Hammerstein. Uh, he has written the musicals Grey Gardens and is working on Finding Neverland about J.M. Barry. Welcome back to Theater Talk. Good to be back. Um, okay, Arthur. Uh, Finian's Rainbow has always been considered one of the, the great musicals of all time. Certainly has one of the greatest scores, really. But there's always been this problem of reviving it because of the subject matter dealing with race. And we should say that in the show, there's a racist Southern senator That's who, right. through a lightning strike, is converted into a black man. And this was cutting and daring edge, uh, cutting and, 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 and daring at the time in 1947, but has been considered kind of patronizing and almost racist today. Have you solved that problem in this show? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you do it? <laughs> well, for one thing, we have two different actors playing the two different parts. Uh, originally, uh, when the senator is turned black, by magical means. Mm -hmm. uh, he falls to the ground and uh, is putting blackface on. Uh, and he, he rises up and he's a white man in blackface. And that, of course, wouldn't fly these days. Uh, but by having two different actors, one white and one black, play the role, the one role, uh, I think it, it adds uh, layers that make the piece work much better. Uh, the black actor, as we are doing it now, uh, the change happens instantaneously, and we have a black actor, and he doesn't even know, of course, that he's black. So he's playing this white racist senator in the second act when he finds his voice. We have uh, him in the song The Begat. He just takes over the song. And it, it becomes a celebration of this new person he's become. Michael, how controversial was this in its day, this, this stage of magic of transforming the racist white southern senator into a black man? I think in its day, um, he got the blend of politics and humor and whimsy and charm right. Mm -hmm. And I think they thought it was hilarious in its day, but that was uh, many years ago. It, it has been difficult to revive. I remember how they dealt with it in the movie version which Francis Ford Coppola did. And which was not it by was, any no, means successful. I think that, no, they haven't been able to deal with it. But in its day, it was considered hilarious. But I did go back and read some of the original reviews, and they noted that they felt there was a hint of vulgarity. That might have been their euphemism for it. Mm -hmm. What do you think they meant by vulgarity? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> it could have meant anything, because they weren't saying what they thought. Uh, there were sexual innuendos in the piece, too. I think at one point, uh, that old lyricist technique of using a naughty word and describing it, he rhymes class with ass, and then he adds the ter for aster, or something like that, <laughs> those kind of things. And of, course, yeah. oh, the aster, and of course, he sings, when I'm not near the girl that I love, which was much more salacious in those days. Well, the that, idea is the perfect, infidelity. that is the yeah. perfect excuse for the male libido, uh, <laughs> still. I uh, love that song. <laughs> it's a wonderful song, and it's very sexual. And I think there was a, there's a, a version of the record where Harburg sings it himself, yeah. and you know that leprechaun is him. He was always a champion of uh, left-wing social causes from the beginning of his career as a lyricist when he wrote Buddy Can You Spare Fair a Dime, mm -hmm. which was so wonderful. And then at the time he wrote Finian's Rainbow, is it not correct, Michael, he was blacklisted. Well, he was certainly about to be blacklisted if it wasn't then. Well, it was 47. It would have been uh, a little Right, yeah. but McCarthyism was just coming in, mm -hmm. and he wrote his next show in the, in the height of it when he wasn't allowed to work in Hollywood anymore, and that was Flahui, and that was 51. It was a very bitter, dark show. Finian was lighthearted, even mm -hmm. though he got in all of his, his darts against the establishment. I think he got the balance right, and the way I think he did it, um, 
was by being a master lyricist and helping the composer write hit after hit after hit. Yeah. Finian's Rainbow has what? How many cl would be say classic songs? Oh, now? Mm, I think it must be like Zet and Blackamora, That Old Devil Moon, Look, Look to the, the Rainbow, rainbow. Yep. When I'm Not Near, near the, the Girl, girl I, I Love. love. I'm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wasn't this the first integrated yes. chorus yes. on Broadway? So now we say, ah, these racial elements se seemed a little dated until you've changed it to become appropriate, but, but <laughs> at the time it, it was terribly liberal because he was integrating the chorus, which, which alas hadn't been done until that. Yeah, time. oh by the way, I don't think I've changed it. I think I brought out what is there and made it something that we can, we can relate to a little bit more, but part of that is, is, is tying in the race and the economic values that he talks about. Uh, because Yip always felt, and I think we feel today, most of us, that those are not separate, that they're interrelated. This musical certainly is appropriate for our economic times, isn't it? That it's dealing with credit and... Credit and finding the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> yes. um, and stealing it. But, uh, <laughs> That's Yip's impish little... Uh, and, and the whole idea of when the idle rich, when the idle poor become the, the idle, idle rich, rich. Um, I think it was, you studied his papers, and I have mm -hmm. not. I only look at this, his work right. from a lyricist's point of view, but it seems to me that aside from The Wizard of Oz, almost everything else was that he was trying to blend his personal politics, which he felt strongly about, bring what he felt was true to mm -hmm. the stage, with his sense of whimsy and delight and entertainment. Uh, it was in uh, Bloomer Girl, which was about feminism. It was uh, in, of course, Finian. Uh, it was in the next one, Flahui, which was a, a, a screed against capitalism. The most happy, the happiest girl in the world was sexual politics, Lisa Strada, and on and on. Um, but in Finian, the entertainment was in the right proportion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he also was an innovator in Finian in the, in the lyrics. Uh, For example? Well, um, if you look at his earlier work, like uh, Bloomer Girl, he was still very much in the spell of Gilbert and Sullivan. He apparently grew up on the Lower East Side with the Gershwins, was good friends with Ira, and right. together they loved G and S, as mm -hmm. it's called. Now, most people know of it as Pinafore and Pirates, which don't seem political. But the real G and S people love the one called Iolanthe, mm -hmm. which is about the fairies get angry at the House of Lords and decide to take over Parliament. And it's filled with politics, and it came from W.S. Gilbert's feeling that he could blend that whimsy with politics and really give it mm -hmm. to the establishment. Um, and it ended up with the House of Lords having to be elected by competitive examination instead of by birthright. Um, and I'm sure that both Ira and Yip were intimately acquainted with that because I see references to it throughout the work and the kind of rhymes that Yip played with where he made up words mm -hmm. um, and uh, added an ish or uh, something or, or, sort or, of or, grandish or, or, yes or would leave off a syllable like my circumstance or uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it was just so delightful that the ear is pulled in and has to listen to what's to what's coming next and how he's going to get back to the hook the hook is the title of every song, uh, and uh, and he has hooks galore in Finian, and and the way he stresses them, the, the, the what he did structurally that was so interested is the, the usual forms of songwriting are A A B A, mm -hmm. or A B A C, a big Irving Berlin favorite, or verse chorus, which is what most rock and roll is, verse chorus, and that's a Meaning way you start the you, you give an introductory statement and then you bang into the, the big hit the tune big, that is that's make right the song and away. that's got the title in it and then you mm -hmm. hear a little bit more of a preamble and you get the big thing right. that's the chorus that's verse chorus in theater it's verse means something else traditionally verse means introduction mm -hmm. and then you sing a a b a and your a somewhere in that a is your hook your B goes off into dreamland and your final A comes back to the hook. Well, he came up with new forms in Finian's Rainbow. He came up with ABA. Um, he came up with AAA. BB, AAA. My heart's in a pickle. It's constantly pickle. And not too far pickle, I fear. When I'm not near the girl I love. I love the girl I need. Yep, 
was a big believer in the power of songs to change people's minds and not only to entertain but to make them think. And I suppose you could say that's true of Binion's Rainbow as a whole, that it's very entertaining and it makes you think, and it was his most successful musical, of course. It's an interesting point you make, that he's playing with the forms, and yet, though, the songs still, they st standards, they sound to us, our ears, as if, you know, you could have hear, heard them on the radio, big popular hits, and yet, underneath it all, this complexity is going There's, on. It's, it's an effort to get the hook heard as often as possible. Mm -hmm. um, or if he doesn't use the actual hook, then he'll do a parallel structure. Uh, if I'm not near the girl I love, I love the girl I'm near. If I'm not, uh, if I'm not facing the face that I fancy, face, I fancy, I fancy the, the face, face, I, face. I, face. I face. So you're waiting for him to come back to love the girl I near because he said it's a big setup, mm -hmm. and it's basically the same thought over and over and over. And thus, the play can be as political and as crazy as it wants because every time a song comes along, you relax into it, you're home again, and then you can, and then the book writer can take it off onto a new tangent. The songs are the anchor. Mm. Uh, I, it's a little bit like a uh, funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Uh, the songs serve as almost resting points mm. where you can bring home a point. They're not advancing the action in Finian as much as they do in other shows of his. But They're there more, are political songs. There are. Necessity is a political ne song, and uh, Idle Poor, Idle Rich has, has commentary in it. So yeah. I think it's all part and parcel of He's the He's a same bit like thing. sort of Michael Moore. I mean, you know, the hard left uh, viewpoint yes. delivered in an extremely entertaining, affable way. Well, I'm not sure how hard left it really is. I think uh, he, was, he was certainly very liberal, and he did get blacklisted. Well, well you call him hard left, but that he was championing going back to Buddy Can Use Paradigm, the fact that people were going he was champion and nobody uh, telling them. Yeah. Well, we should very, we've got Absolutely. to wrap it up. We should very quickly say, I mean, one of the keys to understanding him, though, is he grew up very, very poor. He knew. He did. He knew what, he knew what poverty was. No, and oh, he yeah. felt, but I mean, Buddy Can Use Paradigm is, is magnificent because it, it in, in catchy language, it, it deals with people in uh, the state of planned obsolescence. The system uses them up. Once the railroad is done, once the tower is built and done, what do you do with the guy who built it? Yeah. And um, that was the anthem of the depression. He, that's right. And he personalizes it by saying, hey, I was the guy with the drum when I went and fought for you. Right. And it's so personal. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Um, all right, well, uh, you can hear the uh, lyrics of Lip Harburg, and we should say the music of Burton Lane, a composer that I always thought was terrific. And it was always a, uh, terrible. I thought that Burton Lane never wrote more M m more yeah. musicals. Um, Finian's Rainbow is at the St. James with a new book by Arthur Perlman. Thank you for your insights tonight, Arthur. Thank and you. our friend Michael Corey, who's got uh, Finding Neverland coming up, the musical about J.M. Barry. Thanks for coming on. And I talk. should say, Michael, that they should have thanked you at the Emmy Awards for those wonderful plot points that you dreamed up for Grey Gardens that they adapted in the TV movie so wonderfully and won a lot of awards. But no kudos comments. to you. What would you say to the uh, comment that this show is dated and that the reason it hasn't been done for all these years is that it's sort of socially old-fashioned? I was laboring under that suspicion too when I first heard they were doing it and then I thought well, you know what this is the time of Obama and oddly enough my character is a person who experiences being white and being black and our president is a person whose parents are white and black, ah. African and black. <laughs> and how relevant is that? You know what I mean? And this character goes through a journey where he finally says, you know, I see both sides. And here we have a wonderful leader who sees both sides. So I, I can't imagine how more relevant it could be. This show is incredibly current. And that's what the kind of surprise that we've all found. We're like, wow. I mean, I have this big speech at the end of Act One about Listen, don't, everybody's discovering credit for the first time and considering, obviously, the credit crisis we're all in. Um, it's, it's incredibly, it speaks to what we're doing right now and what we're all dealing with. Racism, absolutely. I, I would say that it's maybe dated in the best way because uh, the things that we talk about in the show are still relevant right now. Immigration. Uh, racism and a credit crunch. We have all, all three <laughs> things that are happening in the United States right now. So maybe it was ahead of his time when it was written in 1947. Uh, but w we have a man who learns the error of his ways and becomes a better man by turning into a black man. It was a 1940s attempt at exploring race and finance. And as we see in a lot of 
crazy art that has, you know, emerged over the years. Things that seem dated suddenly, sporadically, seem so right now um, uh, in many different forms. And this show is bizarrely really topical right now. I think it's serendipitous that this moment has arrived and Finian's Rainbow is here when we have a black president and we have financial issues uh, abound. And, um, and it's ultimately a show about, you know, hope. It's a period piece that is saying everything today, what was said in 1947, is true today. So who could say that it's dated? Just say 